So um, we called this from Aleppo to Zanzibar um, because we actually have deep connections to both places. And there are a lot, there's a lot on the news right now about what's happening um, in Iraq and Syria. And a few months ago, a lot in the news about what had happened in Timbuktu with these um, extraordinarily uh, important tombs, uh, libraries, and mausolea um, being attacked. And so that we really, we could have picked almost any um, set of topics. And um, I'm going to focus a lot on um, Syria, Iraq, and Zanzibar. So um, when we were um, thinking about this, um, Syria was much in the news, um, unfortunately, for a lot of the wrong reasons. But uh, it's not a cliche to say that Syria and Iraq are the um, cradle of civilization because they indeed are. And the earliest settlements that have been excavated have been found in that region. And Mesopotamian area studies really began in the 18th century, uh, certainly flourished in the 19th and early 20th century. And much, of we, much that we know about the whole development of humankind really stems from some of these extraordinary places. And this is the Citadel of Aleppo, uh, really one of the oldest continuously used uh, sites in the world. Um, some of the earliest remains on the Citadel date to the 10th century BC. And it was used as a citadel right through the Ottoman era. And it was still used today, um, no longer as a citadel, but as a museum, an archaeological zone, and a public gathering place. And WMF became involved in the Citadel of Aleppo about 15 years ago in collaboration with the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. And the goal of the project was to make this a more hospitable place for tourists. And as you can see, it's the highest point in the city. So the views from atop the Citadel are extraordinary. Clearly in antiquity uh, and through the Ottoman period, they were an important defensive measure. Uh, if, uh, if need be, people could have retreated back to the Citadel area for safety. Um, it was a very impenetrable uh, site throughout its history. And we became involved because there was a section of the Citadel known as the Temple of the Storm God and uh, a Hittite temple, one of the earliest unexcavated areas on the site. And we were involved in what was primarily a German-Syrian collaborative effort to excavate this area. And we were helping with some conservation issues and master planning. The Aga Khan Trust for Culture was deeply engaged in really renewing the whole space as a public venue. So they took uh, an Ottoman era barracks to turn it into a uh, visitor center, a bookstore, gift shop, um, cafe. And really, a lot about the Citadel was vastly improved during those 10 years of engagement. And this was our area called the Temple of the Storm God. And as you can see, it's quite a deep excavation. And the Temple of the Storm God was a place that had been quite famous through the Middle Ages and then had somewhat dis disappeared from sort of physical presence on the Citadel as other things uh, in the Middle Ages got built up around the site. And it was known to have been a very, very large area. So when they were first excavating and they found sometimes confusing indications of where the foundations and walls might have been, they continued to excavate out. And the most extraordinary find uh, at the Temple of the Storm God was not the foundations and not any re remains of walls, but 23 basalt reliefs that had been inside the temple and miraculously had survived. And so this is more or less as they were found. And we helped with the conservation of them, uh, laser scanning of them, documenting them. And the German Syrian archaeological team was working on researching who all the figures were and what these might have meant and matching them up to a number of things that had been written about the Temple of the Storm God um, throughout uh, history. So uh, the, one of the things that the archaeologists did was try to line them up along what would have been most probably their area within the temple. And one of the issues was, because they are basalt and they were originally inside the temple, they couldn't be left out to the elements like this. So in fact, in partnership with the Syrian government, 
and the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, we were engaged for several years in discussions about how best to protect them over time. And this was all um, in about 2007, 8, and 9 when we were having these discussions. And the issues were leaving them in place under some kind of temporary shelter, building some sort of site museum or sort of gentle on the earth shelter, uh, building an actual site museum. And there's, in fact, a theater from the 1980s that was built on the Citadel. So there's uh, a precedent for building an actual building on the Citadel. Uh, also, obviously, moving them to a national museum within Syria was another option. And as we were going round and round, uh, very unfortunately, the Syrian director of the archaeological program passed away. So that sort of gave an opportunity to say, well, since we can't really decide what's the best way to deal with them, let's put them in a protective shelter. So they were all fully documented. They were put um, under layers and layers of sandbagging. Um, this not very beautiful but effective temporary shelter was put on. And we were thinking about holding another uh, design workshop to think about the best uh, final systematic uh, arrangement for them. And then, uh, as we know, war broke out in Syria. And so, well, we felt the citadel of Aleppo is unlikely to be penetrated. There have been a lot of reports about the army uh, and the insurgents variously taking parts of Aleppo. There were um, pictures of the bronze doors at the entrance gate being blown out. But there did not seem to be any news um, of any danger to the site. And we kept monitoring this with colleagues who were still in Aleppo. And so, as I said, we were working on potential design uh, solutions that were just sort of mothballed. And um, here's just another shot of it under its protective shelter. And then very, very unfortunately, literally just last Thursday, a colleague um, wrote to us to tell us just how bad things were in Aleppo and that indeed the citadel was more vulnerable. And in the early days of the outbreak of war in Syria, one of the first things we all heard on the news was that the souk in Aleppo, again, one of the oldest continuously used marketplaces in the region, um, had burned. And so we all had these images in our mind. But you know, we were fairly certain that the temple of the storm god would not be of interest to anybody. And then again, um, this is one of the hotels across the street from the citadel, um, um, mid 19th century building uh, that was still in use. Um, and then we started getting photos like this from our colleagues. But very, very sadly, last Thursday, this was the photo that was sent to Bonnie Burnham, our president, and me, showing that indeed, finally, somebody had developed some curiosity about what was underneath that shelter. And um, much to our dismay, uh, the entire shelter has been uh, dismantled, and the sandbags seem to be gone. And there were thousands and thousands of sandbags, so this took quite an effort. And we can see in the pictures some of the remains of um, the basalt reliefs. But I think you know all of us who were involved in this project will probably regret forever and ever that um, we didn't simply agree to have them moved away to a museum somewhere in Syria. But um, you know, one hopes that one day it'll be possible to see just what shape they're really uh, in, and maybe these photos aren't as dismaying as they seem. One bright spot in all of this, because there is a bright spot in all of this, in that people in Syria are really extraordinarily dedicated to their cultural heritage and recognize that these aren't just pieces of architecture or sculpture or ancient relics from the past, but very much about their identity and our identity um, as a global citizen of the world. And I think that one of the most heartening things has been that the Director General for Antiquities and Museums has really gone to heroic efforts to keep his staff together and to keep everybody in the world informed about what is happening in Syria. And every few months, he posts on his website a list of sites that he can verify have been damaged in some way. Uh, he really went to extraordinary efforts to make sure that all of the museums were as secure as could be. And really, it's hard to imagine how everybody gets up and goes to work every day, because there must be days where it seems like objects in a museum are fairly unimportant, 
in comparison to what's going on in the country. But the Director General, I think, has really shown extraordinary leadership, and it's wonderful that he is being recognized with an award in Venice uh, later this month. And so I think the fact that somebody has gone to the trouble to create a Heritage Rescue Award really says something that we've come a long way to understand, that these are just not inanimate objects, but very much part of the heart and soul of all of us. And, um, you know, to talk about Zanzibar for a moment, um, which has not been in the news uh, for attacks on heritage, uh, and is an extraordinary place and another great crossroads the way Aleppo was, and, um, and a place where uh, there's both um, indigenous culture, there is the beginnings of the Omani Empire stems from Tanzania, uh, there is also uh, British rule of uh, Zanzibar for a long period of time, and um, now a population that is largely Muslim, but very much dominated by relics of the um, British period. So on the uh, left is just an image of Stonetown in Zanzibar, perhaps the best known area of Zanzibar. And um, on the right, the House of Wonders, which is on the 2014 World Monuments Watch. And it's on the watch because it's a building that's now imperiled because of uh, lack of maintenance and the ability for the local authorities to care in the best way possible for the building. It's one of the most prominent buildings because as you approach Stonetown from the sea, it's one of the buildings that nearly everybody passes. And, um, and it's called the House of Wonders because when it was built, um, it was a new building technique um, and this very open um, Victorian architecture, but also it had an elevator, and it was the first elevator in Tanzania. So um, the House of Wonders is a reminder to us all that um, when some buildings were built at the turn of the century in the early 20th century, something that we take for granted today, like an elevator, really was a marvel in its day. And so Zanzibar um, is a major tourism site. Um, and also um, a site with a deep uh, heritage of conflict because it's one of the places where uh, the slave trade endured far later than it did in most other places in the world. And, um, and it was also an extraordinarily profitable slave market and um, a lot of bitterness in the 20th century about that legacy. And um, one of the issues that is a bittersweet pill today is that when uh, slavery ended and the um, Anglican Church and several uh, Anglican groups in England were on a mad building campaign in sub-Saharan Africa and they um, built not in local traditions or local materials but really built um, you know, these very, very British buildings, and these are very large buildings um, throughout Africa, but one of the most prominent ones is the one in Stonetown, Zanzibar, Christ Church. And uh, we were approached by uh, the U.S. Embassy in Tanzania um, about would we be interested in working on a conservation project in Tanzania. And, you know, I will be honest to say that when we were first approached, I thought to myself, I'm not sure we really do. If we're going to work in Tanzania, shouldn't we be working on something that's more a reflection of the local culture today? And um, after uh, getting to know the site better and working with colleagues, we all really came to the realization that this is an important building locally and an important symbol of the history and the complex layers that exist in Stonetown today. And indeed, uh, we've embarked on a project uh, about a year ago, and um, it's interesting because it's a uh, Christian site, but the population is largely Muslim, so all of the tradespeople who are working on the building, um, you know, have a cultural connection to Stonetown, but not necessarily to this church, and yet the traditions we've realized, um, while this looks deceptively like an Anglican building, um, much of the um, detail work, when you get close to it, you realize are all local traditions um, from the 19th century and very specialized stucco work and plaster work and tracery on the windows for which we really did need um, local uh, 
people with very specialized skills. One of the other legacies of this building is that it's essentially built uh, where the slave market was. So there's been long a feeling that there needs to be some better way to reconcile the history of slavery in, in Zanzibar, the Anglican legacy in Zanzibar, and this site. And so one of the outcomes of this project has been the development not just of a conservation program and a training program for young craftspeople working on it, but also ultimately the creation of a visitor center that will have an exhibition that really talks synthetically about uh, the history of slavery in Zanzibar. And so um, our work began, as all conservation projects do, with documentation and archival research, and then uh, this uh, in spring and summer 2014, we really launched all the on-site work. And that was when we really began to discover how magnificent a building this is and how intricate uh, the interior is especially. And so uh, th these are pictures taken from September when um, the completion of the rose window was imminent. And, um, and we can see now how magnificent the building really will look. But to show that there are still issues of uh, acceptance and because there's sometimes um, an unfair backlash against tourists. One of the reasons it's a conflict site today is because there were in 2013 and 2014 several attacks uh, on British tourists who were in Zanzibar, which is really unprecedented. And then uh, there were two incidents in 2014 that were disturbing. One was uh, acid thrown on priests who were walking out of the building, and the other was a bomb that was actually set off um, in front of the church earlier this year. And it gave us all pause, and then the local authorities and the church authorities really took the view that these were one-off events and there was not systematic attacks against um, the very tiny Christian community nor against the tourists. But it was a reminder that uh, sites like this that have complex histories, it can take a long time uh, to get to a new place. And we hope that the conservation project and the exhibition will serve a bit as a bomb on the um, issues and also help bring people together a bit. And uh, this is, we're only at the uh, nascent stage of the exhibition research. There's a woman, a local researcher who's been going through archival records and also interviewing the descendants of families in Zanzibar. And because slavery ended so late, um, there are indeed a lot of families in Zanzibar um, who know very well which of their uh, ancestors uh, were slaves or sold into slavery. So I thought some more about what is the context for all of this. And we live in such a hypermedia age and we find out about so many of these incidents so quickly. And uh, we can go on Facebook and Twitter and hear people's thoughts about um, what's happening in the various countries that are unfortunately in conflict. And then I started to think about the fact that really um, we've been destroying each other's cultural heritage since time began. And I began to think, I was an art history major as an undergraduate, and I began to think about how many of the great paintings in fact, um, many times are exalting the virtues of having sacked someplace. So this is the Romans sacking Jerusalem in uh, the year 70 AD. Uh, it's a French uh, painting from the 18th century. And, uh, and I could have picked hundreds of pictures because the uh, sack of Jerusalem uh, is depicted uh, throughout uh, the Renaissance and Baroque period. So we've been uh, not only uh, destroying people's cultural heritage as a way um, to show we're victors, um, but we memorialize it in a variety of ways. And it struck me um, 
Rome being one of my favorite places on the planet and someplace I've spent a lot of time in, it dawned on me that a building I use as a touchstone often when I need people to meet me someplace and I say, well, we can meet at the Ar Arch of Titus. And I thought, oh my goodness, what does the Arch of Titus represent but the sack of Jerusalem? And indeed, this panel on the uh, right that's inside um, is a depiction of the end of the siege of Jerusalem and you can clearly see people carrying a menorah and, uh, and I thought, well, you know, it's funny when you study this as art history, you don't really think about it. And I think because of my work at World Monuments Fund, and I've traveled to so many of these places, that I started to think about all of this in a very different way. So then I also thought, well, uh, you know, it's not just what we can see in paintings, but in the not uh, so distant past, um, we know that in World War I and World War II, extraordinary places in Europe were uh, bombed and otherwise destroyed. This is the town of Ypres in Belgium, which is a thriving city today um, and a desirable place to visit. Um, but I was thinking about the fact that the entire streetscape of this town has changed innumerable times in its history. It was actually sacked by the Romans, so one group was going off uh, towards Jerusalem, and the other group was heading uh, towards the British Isles, and along the way hit Belgium. And so it was then, uh, sat in the Middle Ages, it was a major economic hub, famous for its tapestries, and, um, and it was sacked uh, by the Britons in the 12th century. And then uh, it was sacked by the French in the 16th century, then it went to uh, Spanish rule in the 17th century, and then in the 18th century it went under Habsburg rule. So the entire streetscape of this town has changed in each era um, by a different culture that is now in ruling. And then in World War I, uh, vir virtually the entire town was leveled. And so I, I began to think about the fact how much of our lives is spent uh, rebuilding. And even though today the consequences may seem greater because the weaponry can do more damage and we find out about it sooner, it's clearly uh, an unfortunate side of our uh, DNA. But um, also on the watch in 2012 was Coven Coventry Cathedral in England um, and uh, a beautiful medieval cathedral um, with an extraordinary collection of stained glass. Uh, that was bombed during World War II, and in fact, one of the um, very early bombings. And a decision was made not to rebuild the church. And it's often held out as an example of uh, how to reconcile the past and the present and give a future to a building. So you see on uh, the picture on the right, you see on the left the remains of the um, medieval cathedral. And then on the right, you see the building that was built uh, after World War II. And the clergy at Coventry almost immediately began to put themselves forward as having a, um, a motivation for reconciliation and wanted to be seen as a center where the liturgy could focus on what happens in times of conflict. And they still hold to that tenant today that they are a place of reconciliation and in fact, the outer walls of the church that were left standing, of the old church, indeed, that inner courtyard was, was, well, what was the inside of the church became a courtyard and a place that was meant for contemplation. And so it was on the watch because indeed what had happened after 50 years of being open to the elements, the medieval structure was starting to um, deteriorate and destabilize. And so our project was to help the church uh, regain the stability of that structure so that it could remain a place of contemplation. But interestingly, um, everybody had sort of forgotten what had happened to the crypts underneath the original church. And an aspect of trying to figure out what the measures were from a conservation standpoint, we needed to get into the crypts. And in doing so, it was discovered that all the stained glass that had thought to have been lost had been very carefully put in trays um, and simply forgotten. And, um, and so a great rediscovery was all of this medieval stained glass. And our colleagues at WMF Britain worked with their colleagues at Coventry and with um, conservators 
to completely restore and catalog as much of the stained glass as possible. And while it can't be reinserted into the building, there'll be an on-site museum that will now display all of this. So a fascinating rediscovery um, because of a conservation problem that needed to be solved. Um, but also just a reminder of um, how treasured these objects can be. Then, uh, how did World Monuments Fund end up talking about any of this? So World Monuments Fund was founded in 1965 by a man named Colonel James Gray. He was a retired uh, US Army officer, and he was an engineer by training. He'd been part of the post-war reconstruction team in Italy. After he retired, he decided to stay in Italy, and he was living in northern Italy in Verona. And um, he was somebody who didn't take to retirement so well. So he began a friendship with a number of Italian uh, engineers, art historians, and conservators. And we always say that our very first project was the Leaning Tower of Pisa, because Jim Gray was invited by a group of Italians to come and look at the fact that they felt the leaning was accelerating, and they weren't sure what to do. And there were a lot of proposals at the time um, about different engineering efforts that could be implemented, including freezing the ground and having different pulley systems. And so Jim became engaged in these discussions about what to do with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, founded what was then called the International Fund for Monuments in 1965. And then in 1966, the floods of Venice happened. And he was living um, very nearby. And so our origins in many ways are about disaster recovery. And he became one of the people who was passionate about raising money for Venice and recovering and helping the city not merely restore buildings, but try and analyze the issues that had come to light because of the severe flooding. And then his next two projects, I think when you take the three of them together, are emblematic of who we became as an institution. So the second project was tackling the conservation of the churches of Lalibela in Ethiopia. And, um, and uh, Jim Gray mounted a project that was fascinating because uh, he went to the US Embassy in uh, Ethiopia and basically said, you should help with this. And there was, uh, there was debt between the US government and the uh, Ethiopian government, and he basically brokered a deal so that there would be forgiveness of the loan uh, in order to pay for the work. And then he also went to Ethiopian Airlines um, and also had Princess Mariam of the royal family become a patron of the project. So he went from not knowing anything about the nonprofit world to really being a supreme uh, dealer in all of this, and in fact mounted a project that lasted for several years to help restore the churches. And then we could have a whole other lecture about what WMF has done subsequently in Ethiopia because it's a fascinating tale as well. Then the third project, as unlikely as it may be, was he became a passionate advocate for preventing a landing strip from being built on Easter Island. And uh, you know, you think, how can one person alone in retirement have a project going in Venice, a project going in Lalibela, and a project going in Ethiopia? But he managed. And, um, and the fascinating thing is, uh, what they were proposing to do would have indeed changed the cultural landscape of uh, Easter Island forever. And I don't know why he was motivated to tackle this, but he ultimately did something we would never do today, which is he somehow managed to take one of the Moai sculpture from Easter Island to New York City and mounted it in front of the Seagram's building, got it on the front page of the New York Times, and really managed to demonstrate that you would destroy the ecosystem on the island if you built this landing strip and refueling station. So while there is a modest airport on the island, he was very successful in those three early efforts, I think, in laying out what we became as an institution. And from 1965 to uh, 1985, Jim Gray ran the organization. And it was a series of very interesting projects many of them in Europe, but all of them with the backdrop of these three early dramatic projects. Then in 1985, Bonnie Burnham became really WMF's full, first full-time employee, and she's now our president. 
And uh, she went from being a one-person organization to transforming the organization to what we are today. And next year, we celebrate our 50th anniversary. So we really uh, owe Bonnie a lot for the transformation of the organization. And one of the things that she tackled at the end of the 80s was really the issue of what was happening to cultural heritage as the East Block was opening and the wall was coming down. And one of the most amazing things was a man contacted Bonnie named Dinu Jurescu, who was an art historian, who had uh, just fled with his family from Romania to the United States before the wall came down. And one of the things he came with was a story of the very dramatic situation in Romania where historic buildings throughout the country were being systematically destroyed. And The Raising of Romania's Past was a book that Dinu and World Monuments Fund wrote together. Uh, it was actually published by um, World Monuments Fund and US ECOMOS, the International Council of Monuments and Sites. And it was really the first time any of us had any way to confront this issue of uh, the loss of heritage on this scale and what it means politically when buildings like this come under attack because it's not just one building. This was the systematic removal of entire towns from the map. So they would literally arrive, bulldoze dozens of buildings and take the name off the map. So the next time you saw a map of Romania, that town didn't exist. The exit on the highway was no longer there. Um, and Dinu really told a story of wiping out the memory of an entire population by allowing this to happen. And World Monuments Fund, really with no uh, previous experience in this, mounted a fairly sophisticated advocacy campaign about this sort of activity. And so it's the backdrop to what ultimately became, in many ways, our watch program and what would make me want to talk about uh, heritage at risk today. Because I think behind every one of these stories of something terrible happening to heritage are several heroic figures who try to stand up and tell the world what's at stake. And that led us uh, in 1989 to accept an invitation from the Cambodian government to come to Cambodia and help them assess Angkor. And um, really against all odds, a bit like going to uh, Easter Island or Lalibela in the 1960s, uh, Bonnie Burnham accepted that invitation and mounted a mission in 1989. Uh, and, you know, literally how much the world has changed. You know, we think nothing about communication today, but this whole negotiation happened by telegram. And so the telegrams, you know, ended with visas at border. And so off they went and uh, were escorted by the military to Angkor. And uh, Angkor, was the most mined country ever. And so there are still landmines found around the country today. People still uh, suffer the loss of limbs and life because of it. And oddly, people often think that the Khmer Rouge would have uh, done something to Angkor. But indeed, they did not, because they took it as their symbol. So interestingly, Cambodia is the only country in the world with a heritage symbol on its flag, and that is the symbol of Angkor Wat. And uh, interestingly, the flag has always had Angkor from the early 19th century when they first had a national flag through today where it still is on the flag. And the only time Angkor was not on the Cambodian flag was when it was a UN protectorate. So, you know, it's interesting. This is how deeply held uh, Angkor is in the hearts and minds of all Cambodians. And we embarked on a series of conservation projects, uh, indeed at Angkor Wat, uh, at Preya Khan, which is a monastic complex within the Angkor Archaeological Park, and at Phnom Bacane, which is the oldest temple in the park. And again, those could all be uh, the backdrops for a whole other lecture, because we've worked nonstop in Cambodia for 25 years now. Uh, we employ 120 Cambodians full time. We started with a small crew of people, uh, because indeed the country was decimated by the Khmer Rouge. So we had a group of people who had graduated from Royal University in Phnom Penh, and were embarking on life as uh, architects and worked with us on documentation and ultimately on conservation. And we're very proud that one of the women who was in the very first training group is now head of our entire conservation crew.
And so it's not always a bleak story, although in those early years at Angkor, one of the devastations was, again, not the Khmer Rouge, but the extreme looting that went on all over the site. And it was terrible to see, as the conservation work was going on, the continuing looting of the site. Uh, but fortunately, because of the efforts of UNESCO and many countries that came to the aid of Cambodia, after the Khmer Rouge period and once there was a stable government in place, all of those problems um, have been abated. They never go completely away, as we know, but they're vastly reduced. And I think one of the greatest success stories of not just our work in Angkor, but really the resiliency of the Cambodians is that uh, last year in 2013, we started to think about the number of people who'd worked for us for 10 years or more, and we decided to have a special ceremony to give a certificate to everybody who'd worked for us for more than a decade. And then um, we asked one of our colleagues if uh, he would take a photo for us, and it was his idea to get everybody to climb up on the scaffolding at Phnom Bikane, uh and the staircase. And so it was really, when I got that photo uh, via email, I thought how much the world has changed. We're not dealing with telegrams anymore, but we're also dealing with a magnificent crew of people who are fully in command of the caretaking and safeguarding of their cultural heritage. And we've played a small role in that, but a reminder that there's a resiliency that it's hard to see in the thick of it, but um, does come out once peace comes. So I um, personally have been very involved in our work in Iraq. And so, um, you know, perhaps while all of my coll colleagues are empathetic, perhaps more than most, I. Um, Every time I see the word Erbil in the news, I cringe a little and uh, worry about uh, the friends and colleagues that we've been working with there. And we became involved in uh, the project at Babylon in 2007. And we were invited by uh, the State Department of Antiquities and Heritage and the US Department of State to help create a site management plan for Babylon. And ultimately, we worked on the site management plan with our Iraqi colleagues, and we began a conservation project on site. And in that era, one of the reasons the US government was interested in helping with the site management plan was that uh, somehow it's impossible to think that you would get to the world's most famous archaeological site and decide to encamp on it. But indeed, um, there was Camp Alpha at Babylon in Iraq uh, when the US invasion occurred. And in defense of the military, I will say that there was a major road that connected Babylon to Baghdad. There was a conference center that Saddam Hussein had built. There was a major communications network that had been put in place during the Saddam Hussein era. There was a helicopter landing pad adjacent to the site. And I'm not defending why we would encamp at an archaeological site. But from a military standpoint, I can understand why you would take out a map and see this as a strategic location just 80 miles south of Baghdad. So as we began the project, we were um, under a lot of pressure because there were a lot of people who wanted to blame the US government for all the damage on the site. And one of the things we discovered was that there really had been benign neglect of the site for many years. And the worst damage to the site was not from the military, but really from water damage. Um, as maintenance had not occurred for many years and paths had been put in so that water didn't wick properly from the site. But, you know, nonetheless, we did deal with a lot of the cleanup from when the military had been there. And one of the things that's always fun when you embark on these projects, particularly for well-known sites, is to look for archival images. So in the archives of the British Museum, there's a photograph uh, on the left of British soldiers at the Lion of Babylon. And then we found a photo from the early 2000s of Iraqi soldiers at the Lion of Babylon. So um, in every era, everybody wants to take their photo um, with this extraordinary uh, sculpture from uh, early antiquity. And then we began in 2000 nine, really, an on-site documentation program. But it was still during a period when there was some military occupation near the site and also still a somewhat unstable condition so that we went in with military escorts. But over the years, things seemed to be stabilizing, and our project really flourished. And in fact, um, this is an example of the kind of water damage we found at the site, which had nothing 
to do with anything other than the fact that uh, water was no longer shedding away from the building and was pouring against it. And so these are mud bricks that are very vulnerable to water. So as water was being drawn up into the buildings, the bricks eventually would become fully saturated. So uh, on the, the person in the white hat is my colleague, Jeff Allen, who really was leading this program. And then the person in the green hat is Gina Haney, who ultimately worked with us at Babylon, but also went on to help us at a project in Erbil in the north. And in 2012, uh, our site management planning program was going well. The conservation projects at several buildings were going well. And the worst thing that happened in that era was the Iraqi government elected to build a pipeline uh, through the archaeological zone. And so we were no longer thinking about military assaults on the site. Um, there really was a sense of security throughout southern Iraq. And you know, we were appalled that the pipeline would be built. But little did we know that in 2014, in March, uh, violence would return to southern Iraq. And this is the checkpoint adjacent to the archaeological site that was blown up. And you know, it was really um, a, a, an inexplicable moment for all of us, because it seemed that things were going so well. And little did we know it would be the prelude to the problems today. And as I mentioned, we were also working in the north. So in 2013, we embarked on the development of a training program for Iraqi and Kurdish professionals. And we were running these modules on site management planning. This is the Erbil Citadel, also one of the oldest continuously used uh, settlements. People were still living in uh, the Erbil Citadel until the 19th century. Uh, and then uh, eventually a road was built across the top of the citadel and houses were destroyed. And that was sort of the beginning of moving down into the lower city. And when I was in Erbil in 2013, in April and then again in November, what I was really struck by was what a boom town Erbil was. And in just that six month period, Dozens more buildings had gone up, more buildings were under construction, there were major hotel chains building hotels in Erbil, and there seemed to be a buoyancy to the entire community. And rather than teach our program in the classroom, we were going out uh, throughout the entire Kurdish region and um, mapping a lot of sites and then developing our entire training program around being able to look at specific sites and discuss them. And so it was really a shock um, to have a war break out in the Kurdish region and have Erbil suddenly in the news. And I was struck in particular when they were talking about the Mosul Dam and talking about what was happening in the north, because here we all are at a site called Jirwana, which is an 8th century BC aqueduct system that ran from uh, Kinnis in the north to Nineveh, uh, not really in the south of Iraq, just a bit south of Mosul. But um, it's one of the oldest remnants of an aqueduct system. And you know, I was really struck when they were talking about Mosul Dam because this aqueduct system ultimately is what gave rise to being able to build a modern dam today. But I was thinking, you know, we, we really were out there without a care in the world. And, and it was such a moment of discovery to see all of these places and think about all of the things that we could discover as we continued our program and explored the Kurdish region more and more. So unfortunately, today, Erbil has become a place of refugees. And um, really, more than 100,000 people have poured into uh, the area because as uh, the situation became destabilized in the south, those who could crossed to the border into the Kurdish region. And so, um, you know, what do we do to take a stand on all of this? Because obviously, uh, during times of armed conflict, there's not much any of us can do. And uh, so the watch was developed in 1996 as a call to action for heritage. It was not intended to be a call for protection of sites during armed conflict, but increasingly the watch has become one vehicle. And so we put the entire country of Iraq on the watch in the early 2000s. And then uh, more recently, we put the entire country of Syria and Mali on. 
And, um, and there, while that doesn't do anything to improve the lives of people living in the conflict zones, and it doesn't especially protect the sites, it's at least a way to talk to the media and others about the situation. And a, a group called the International Center of Museums uh, has something called the Red List, which is a reminder to people not to buy works of art from conflict zones because they are likely looted um, and potentially uh, fueling an even greater problem. And then uh, there's uh, the Hague Convention, which was developed after World War II. Uh, the US is a signatory to the Hague Convention, as are more than 100 countries around the world. And it specifically has a clause about protecting heritage during times of conflict. And there was a 50th anniversary of the Hague Convention uh, event in Washington, DC a few weeks ago. And um, this man is a man named uh, Harry Etlinger. He's the last uh, of the living monuments men. And uh, separate from the movie, uh, you know, the, this was a group of uh, art historians, archaeologists, photographers, architects, designers who were mobilized uh, during World War II, famously to um, document the condition of monuments and also to help with the restitution of works of art that had been looted by the Nazis. And you know, like all conferences, this was not the best conference I'd ever gone to, but it was by no means the worst. And it was a fascinating group of speakers. But Harry Etlinger in particular, it struck me that uh, for somebody who is the last remaining of his contemporaries of that period, he actually struck me uh, as providing what was the most important statement of the day because his, his comment was, and he is German by birth, he came to the United States when he was a child. Uh, one of the things he said was, you know, he didn't imagine growing up in Germany that he would do his bar mitzvah in Newark, New Jersey. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, that got a chuckle from the audience then, but I'm sure when he was a child, he certainly did not expect Newark, New Jersey um, to be in his horizon. But I thought that the most important thing he said during his speech was not any of the anecdotes he told about the exploits of um, you know, being part of the Monuments Men, um, or talking about being AWOL. He had a fascinating story about when he should have been in one place and he was in another and got caught. But um, I think it was, he said that from his point of view, as a German Jew who had emigrated to the United States as a child, become an American and ultimately been part of this civil service, um, his view was it was the most extraordinary thing that the American and British governments we're trying to return cultural property to people. That in general, as a race, we have spent centuries taking cultural heritage from people. And uh, either to demonstrate our power over some place or uh, simply to cart things back, whether it's taking something from Egypt and putting it in the center of Rome in antiquity, or uh, during the Napoleonic era, uh, taking things to uh, populate what's now the Louvre. But from his point of view, he couldn't imagine what would motivate a country, two countries, to so systematically try to do their best to return works of art to the museums where they belonged and the families to whom they belonged. And I thought that was an extraordinary thing to say because I had never quite thought of it that way. And, you know, we live in a complicated time. We don't always think governments act nobly. And there was Harry Etlinger really speaking eloquently about the fact that World War II was a terrible period, but here were two countries trying to do their best to um, return not just daily life to people, but a kind of dignity by giving them their cultural heritage back. And so I thought, you know, Every day we try and do our best, or at least I hope we get up and try and do our best every day. And uh, when I was in uh, Erbil, it happened that the Monuments Man movie was being shown, and uh, the students all wanted to go. And at the end, uh, they wanted to take their photo in front of the poster for the movie. And then, you know, we had a lot of discussions about what is cultural heritage and what is a shared heritage and how do we all work together? And they really all thought of themselves as the potential to be monuments men in their own country. And so I wanted to end with um, a high note, which is our work in Cambodia, I think, really has been 
symbolic for everyone at WMF, whether they're directly involved in the project or not. And we all feel very good about the efforts we've done to raise money and to train a group of people to work on the projects. And one day we won't be working in Cambodia anymore, but I think we leave an important legacy. And this is a Garuda from Preah Khan. Uh, there were 72 of them on the outer wall of the monastic complex, and they were meant to be the protectors of Preah Khan. And this is what we call Garuda 38, which was just recently restored. And I think that um, it's really, we all want to be the protectors of Preah Khan and the culture around the world. Thank you very much. to answer questions, but I'm going to move slightly because I'm being completely blinded by that light. Um, and uh, yes. I mean, I, there's corruption everywhere. There could easily be corruption in the Kurdish regional government. I mean, I, the Erbil Citadel redevelopment plan has largely been a UNESCO effort. Um, I don't think it's bad that it's proceeded at a snail's pace. They, um, one high point that I didn't mention was in uh, June at the World Heritage Meetings, Erbil Citadel was inscribed on the World Heritage List. Uh, and it's the first site from the Kurdish region to be on the World Heritage List. So this was, you know, really a high point for everybody who worked on that project. I can say that, at least in some of my conversations with people in Erbil, there was a lot of feeling about keeping the work modest uh, until they knew the fate of the World Heritage decision, because 
you know, they didn't want to proceed rapidly with some projects if it was going to turn out to be inappropriate given the inscription. So I don't think it's necessarily a problem that they've gone slowly. Individual buildings have been adopted. Uh, the French Institute of the uh, Near Orient and uh, an Italian research institute and a number of other groups have taken on uh, the Czech government. They've all taken on individual buildings within the citadel that have been restored and opened. Uh, there's a textile museum that was restored in 2013. Uh, there was a controversy about uh, demolishing a gate that had been built in the 1980s uh, versus leaving it in place as a record of a change or returning it to uh, the 19th century gate. And so, I mean, I think that they have tackled some very tough issues and they've done it slowly. And, um, you know, they're, I don't know anything about any corruption, but conservation projects unfold slowly. I don't know that, <laughs> I don't know that that is a reason other than they, these are tough decisions and they take a lot of money. So. Other questions? Yes. Yes. They joined the time of independence in 63, Zanzibar and Tank and Ben Tank and Nika. Uh, but they still are quite, in, in many ways, uh, uh, parallel. And, and they're not separate, but they're not totally together. Uh, and they're quite different mm -hmm. places. Uh, two, two things I would just mention as an aside, because it was so good. There was a recent exhibit and book on the art of Tanzania that was at the Queensboro uh, Community College, but the book is, I think, quite extraordinary. In, and I'm relating it to a point you raised, that as people come to be aware of their own art, it redefines their, their they mm -hmm. redefine their presence, their culture, and so forth. And art in Tanzania, this is a little bit extreme, but almost true. People didn't feel they had art because the art was so much a part of the culture and used as part of the culture that mm -hmm. it wasn't something separate. So that, and, and that book, the essays in the book really address some of that while teaching you a lot about the culture, the history, and the art. Anyway, I just wondered whether you had any, uh, not difficulty, but whether, whether in dealing with the Tanzanian government and the Zanzibar <coughs> government, in a sense, you ran into any issues? Uh, we didn't. Um, my colleague, Stephen Battle, who's in charge of that project, uh, worked in Stonetown for a decade um, and worked in uh, other parts of Tanzania for a long time, so he knows uh, the community quite well. Uh, we have another project in Tanzania at Kilwa, which is an archaeological site uh, at uh, the sort of starting point of the Omani Empire. And, um, and we worked on that project very successfully with the Department of Antiquities in Tanzania, working with the local regional government. Um, and when we embarked on the project uh, at uh, Christ Church Cathedral in um, Stonetown in Zanzibar, uh, it was after really a year of discussions with the local heritage authority and the local regional government to really understand what the goals of the project should be. And that's really where the entire idea to create a heritage center came about. So I think there was not an interest in having an isolated conservation project of the church. There was really only an interest in having an integrated plan that was going to provide an educational resource at the end of all of this. So I think if we had said, we're only interested in the building, uh, we would have run into problems. But I think that we too were interested in telling a richer story. And I think uh, Karen Moon, the woman who's working on the research, uh, I think she has found out fascinating family histories that will really provide the basis for exhibitions and oral histories and a lot of activities for years to come. So you know, I, I hope that that's something where the conservation program is a springboard to a lot of other things, and it's important to preserve the building, but it's more important in some ways to participate in these other activities. And I think to your point about sometimes you don't recognize 
that you have art. I think it's the same with the building. The more we discovered some of the physical details of the building, we more and more realized how much a part of uh, Zanzibar culture it really was because these, um, the wooden carved doors and the stucco reliefs, they were really, they were not British. I mean, they were really uh, local materials and local crafts. Yes. You mentioned several instances when you were invited to come in uh, by a certain country. How frequently do you go in without an invitation? Almost never. Um, I really, our entire way of working is collaborative with a local authority. So um, there's almost never an instance where we aren't in some way invited to participate in the project, even when we work in Europe. Um, you know, either because we've worked on another project, somebody suggests we consider working with them in another location. Um, a lot of projects come to us through the watch, and so that might not be an overt invitation, but somebody has to nominate it locally. Somebody has to nominate it from the local environment to the watch. And so if there are sites where we've never worked before or have no history, the watch nominators and the people who endorse the watch nomination become the community to whom we can reach out to understand if there's a possible way to collaborate. Um, but yeah, I think you know we would fail a lot if we weren't um, there at the invitation of somebody. Yes? How much is the quality control of each of these projects in which World Monument Fund gets involved? Uh, the, the organization put the control or the check? It varies from project to project. So uh, we have about 30 employees here in New York and another uh, dozen employees scattered around the globe. And then we have a network of about, um, in any given year, probably 100 to 150 consultants who work for us in a variety of ways on um, projects. So um, in projects in some countries where we're working in collaboration with the Ministry of Culture or a National Heritage Authority, <coughs> excuse me, there may be very little that we need to do in the way of on-site quality control. And then there are other instances, um, for instance, our project in Babylon, that actually required a lot of quality control because there were a lot of archeologists on the staff of the State Board of Antiquities, but very few conservators. <laughs> so one of the reasons they had invited us to work on the project was they really hoped we would develop capacity building programs to rebuild uh, conservation as a, arch archaeological conservation as a field within the country. So one of the reasons we were working on the training program in Erbil was because we were working collaboratively with the State Board of Antiquities and developing this curriculum that matched what they perceived as their needs uh, for their own staff. Oh, sorry, I can't see the light there. Um, is there any evidence of looting at the Aleppo Citadel yet? I understand those pictures are very recent, but there, um, are you reading a lot about, you know, entities, trade, funding, terrorist groups? There are more archaeological sites in Syria that are being heavily looted, that are either in remote areas or um, where there were a lot of things to carry away. At Aleppo Citadel, it's really largely architectural. And um, so there, at least as far as we know, there has not been a lot of looting at the Citadel, which has largely been under the control of the army up till now. So um, we'll see, we've got feelers out to people about what they think has happened at the Temple of the Storm God. But uh, we literally got those photos on Thursday. So, um, you know, we ourselves are still trying to understand. Um, they would not be so easy to move around. They're basalt, so they're light, but they're gigantic. So um, even lightweight, you know, they're, they're as big as I am. So um, you, you'd have to marshal a lot of people to start moving them around. Uh, they're not like things that you might find at an archaeological site, like uh, coins or small pieces of sculpture or uh, <coughs> scroll seals and things like that. So these, these would be not impossible by any means, but 
probably a little harder to move around. At least that's what we hope. Um, yes? Any activity in Afghanistan, and uh, what, if anything, is happening to uh, the big Buddha that was destroyed, or two big Buddhas? Um, uh, we actually are not currently working in Afghanistan, so I can't really speak with any authority. I mean, I'm assuming that um, the looting, which had been evidence in Afghanistan over the last decade, I'm assuming that, like in many countries around the world, it continues. The Bamiyan Buddhas, um, were indeed blown up by the Taliban, mm -hmm. and um, you know that was well documented at the time. Uh, there was fairly rapidly a uh, UNESCO mission that documented uh, the niches where the um, Buddhas had been, and uh, as with all these things, you discover things. There were uh, painted surfaces behind the Buddhas that nobody had known about, and uh, and they also retrieved as much as of the uh, fragments that they could. Uh, there were briefly some discussions about whether the Bamiyan Buddhas could be rebuilt or not. That's not a discussion WMF had anything to do with. I'm just recounting what was you know, uh, recorded in meetings and uh, in newspaper articles that can be found on the internet by anybody. And um, there was briefly a Japanese mission to fully document uh, the uh, Bamiyan Valley, which was done, and uh, and there you know there continues to be a debate about whether they should be rebuilt or not. Ultimately, that will be up to the Afghani government because it's their cultural heritage. Uh, UNESCO has taken the point of view, at least more recently, that they should not be rebuilt. That they were destroyed. Uh, it was an act of terrorism, but uh, that. It's a part of the history of the region now. Uh, there are other people who feel strongly. Uh, they were well documented from the 60s onward. There's a lot of photography, there's a lot of measured drawings, and they could be rebuilt. So this is probably a debate that will play out uh, for a long time into the future. Uh, you know, there, are, there is no answer to this. There is no right or wrong. Um, you know, ultimately, it'll be a local decision about what happens. Um, it's not uh, something in which WMF is engaged. Obviously, at the time, like everybody, we decried the act that would destroy uh, these magnificent ancient Buddhas.